I guess now we move on to the next session, which we have another chair for. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, I already made a small announcement before the next one. So this one, I will not take out any time from uh, our speakers, except at the, when they finish giving their presentation, I will say just a few words of suggestion of how to organize the remaining 30 minutes. So we'll start, as we said, with 20 minutes that are up to uh, our coordinators, in this case, Gabriele Veneziano and David Gross. And I believe uh, Gabriele will start uh, sharing the screen. So Gabriele, go ahead, please. Okay, please take it away. Thank you. We can see the slides, but we cannot hear you. Maybe you are muted. Uh... Okay. Yes. Very good. Now you can hear. Okay. Thank you, Pedro. And thank you, uh, all the organizers, for having asked me to share with David this task of initiating this discussion session on the high energy limit of string theory. Now, I interpreted this task, being an old guy, as uh, telling you about. Uh, recalling some old results, particularly for the young generation. Uh, at least these results I will present will have stood the test of time, but as I will point out all along the way, they also bring up questions which I think are very relevant even today. Uh, in particular, questions that have been asked when in response to the inquiry that uh, David and myself have made. So let me, um, let me start by recalling that the birth of, the, of string theory was very much based on high energy behavior, namely on the Regge limit. Uh, let me remind you that a peculiarity of regipole exchange as, com as compared to elementary particle exchanges in quantum field theory uh, have an imaginary part. Uh, and uh, from there, the duality bootstrap came about trying to relate the behavior of this imaginary part in the reg regime to the contribution of S channel resonances. I should emphasize right away that this works very well, except for the Pomeron, for the vacuum trajectory. And, uh, and that, that led to uh, the dual resonance model. However, soon the emphasis, sorry, I can't see the whole screen myself. Okay, now it's okay. Uh, uh, oh, la la. How come? I cannot go back. I have to scroll back my slide. Click the left arrow, probably it will go back. Yeah, but the left arrow makes. Ah, it's not. Okay. Then you click the screen first and then left arrow. Let's see. Maybe I will. Oh, how come? Usually it works. Yeah. I don't know why it went ahead. Okay, but maybe maybe I will. I will click left arrow. It should work if you click first. Click the screen and then click left arrow. Okay, let's see. Oh, you are right. Perfect. Okay, so um, uh, what I was going to say is that the emphasis with the dual resonance model shifted very early on the duality between resonances in one channel and resonances in the cross channel and on crossing symmetry. In any case, you, the need for an infinite number of resonances of unlimited mass and spin came out of that bootstrap together with linear rigid trajectory, very much suggesting, of course, a stringy interpretation. And right away, uh, one found that there was an exponential suppression at high energy 
and fixed angle, something never seen in quantum field theory. And that uh, suggested, of course, that the colliding objects were extended, soft, missing, saying any point-like constituents. And by the way, this was one of the reasons, not the only one, why this Nambugoto string, as it was later understood to be, uh, lost to the QCD string. And one first question that uh, you know I would like perhaps to discuss with you later is what's the regge limit of large n, just to make it simpler, QCD? I don't think we know yet the answer to that question and how it differs from the, from the string high energy behavior. Now, 20 years later, say 1997, well, the Green-Schwartz revolution had happened and the attention in string theory obviously shifted from hadronic physics to quantum gravity. And some thought experiments were conceived and efforts were made to construct an S matrix for gravitational scattering at very high energy, transplancan energies, and impact parameters smaller than uh, R. Uh, from now on, R will represent in my slides the, uh, the, the, the length associated with the center of mass energy. So R is characteristic of the energy of the collision. And the main questions that we asked at that time were the following. Is quantum information preserved and how in this S metrics approach in which um, I should emphasize in this regime in which classical you expect black hole formation. The second question was what's the form and the role of the short distance string modifications of gravity. And I should emphasize that computations were made in flat space time and that the <clears throat> the effective geometry coming from the collision itself was considered to be an emergent uh, phenomenon. And of course, these days, what about doing the same, but with ADS? Now, uh, a, a very important point I would like to make, which is almost obvious, is that high energy is not necessarily short distance. This is not the same even in a normal quantum field theory without gravity, but with gravity, this is even more the case. And uh, so uh, the, the explanation is extremely simple. Uh, typical gravitational deflection is uh, of order R over B, in four dimensions, so it's slightly different in higher dimensions. And therefore, if you have scattering at high energy and fixed small angle, that probes impact parameters of order R over theta. And since theta is finite and small even, uh, that is bigger than R and grows with energy. So in the presence of gravity, you find that the higher the energy of the collision, the larger at a fixed angle is the distance you are probing. That looks a little bit in contradiction at first sight with the huge momentum transfer, which is of course theta times E, but the explanation of that contradiction, apparent contradiction, is that the large classical momentum transfer is due to the exchange of a very large number of soft quanta. The, each soft quantum carries a typical momentum of order h bar over b, but there are g times s over h bar of them. And that's how you build up your huge momentum transfer by multiplying, if you want, these two factors. This has been called T-channel fractionation. Uh, and by the way, this is a phenomenon which is very well understood and even used in the present amplitude approach to black hole binaries, or the, if you want to the relativistic two-body problem in general relativity. 
I should also mention that theta, the scattering angle, has been known since 1990 up to order r over b cube and is now confirmed by other calculation and believed to be universal in this high energy limit. Now, so the lesson I would like to draw is that if you want to explore short distances, well, you have to go to short distances, not at a high energy and fixed angle. That means you have to prepare your state in a small b state, in a small impact parameter space. Now, yet, if you are in weakly coupled string theory, therefore with a string length which is much bigger than the Planck length, then there is room for a perturbative string gravity regime. In other words, you can put between your L Planck and L string, both the impact parameter and the Schwarzschild radius R. And the reason why this uh, regime becomes perturbative is that the, the uh, expansion parameter, which is in the previous slide was R over B, when you go to B smaller than the string length, becomes effectively R of the string length, which, you know, can be small. And incidentally, you don't have to go to impact parameters smaller than the string length before you see the finite size effects of strings. This kick in at a parametrically larger impact parameter, which is given by this condition, and if you are in the presence of heavy, long strings, they would come up even earlier because then you have to replace the, the fundamental string length with the actual classical string length of your string. Of Just your a comment, length. if you are planning to distribute evenly, you are more or less halfway in the 20 minutes. Of the... Thank you. Yeah, that, that's fine. Thank you very much. So uh, this is just a little picture illustrating this tidal excitation. You, you, know, you arrive with, uh, with, with your highly energetic, say, massless strings, but through the exchange of gravity regions, you can excite, tidally excite your strings. Now, um, what about the actual string gravity regime in which, you, in which your impact parameter is smaller than than the string length and also R is smaller than the string length. So the main things we found were that the string is softening quantum gravity at small b. This is a, what I mentioned already. And this helps very much and actually completely solving the causality problem, which was pointed out a few years ago by Edelstein et al. Uh, another interesting thing is that there is a maximal classical deflection angle, namely when the two big strings uh, graze each other, you reach a maximal deflection angle, which is of the order of R of LS in this regime. Now, of course, you can look at your scattering amplitude at even larger uh, scattering angle, nobody forbids you. And then you find an exponential fall off, which is in agreement with the Gross, Mende, Oguri results in a finite energy range. I should stress that if you go to sufficiently high energy, then fixed angle is not controlled by short distance physics. We also saw the emergence of what I personally consider an effective generalized uncertainty principle, forbidding you from testing uh, distances uh, smaller than the string length. Other people have taken it much more seriously as a modification of, uh, of quantum mechanics. I didn't. And I want to emphasize particularly that there is a, an, an S-channel analog of what I call fractionation or degradation. I don't know what to call it. And black hole like behavior. Now it is in the S channel that the number of uh, strings that you produce grows quadratically in the energy, again, like GS over H bar. 
And therefore, dividing the total energy by the number of final particles, you end up with an average final energy, which is inversely proportional to the incoming energy. The higher the energy you, you send in, the lower the average energy of the final state, which, okay, of course, this is a typical formula for a black hole, typical emitted quantum. Uh, then I want to open just one parenthesis, one slide for two recent developments and applications. And sorry, there are no strings attached here. So one is that the already mentioned uh, 1990 result on Tita turned out to be inconsistent with the high energy limit of Bernard Tal's two loop result on the you know, the relativistic two-body problem in GR. And the solution, which came only about a year ago, is that you need to add to the calculation of Bernet al so-called radiation reaction contributions. And the nice thing is that once you do that, then you get <clears throat> a smooth result at two loop all the way from the deep non-relativistic regime to the ultra relativistic regime. In fact, some people think that maybe it would be very useful besides having the usual post-Newtonian expansion around small velocities to have another expansion near the ultraviolet or ultra relativistic limit. And the second result, recent result, is that gravitational radiation from high energy scattering at small angle, so this dE d omega, turned out to have a bump at omega equal of order one over the impact parameter. And this has just been confirmed by Saho and Sen in this very recent paper. And also perhaps even more interesting, a knee about the Hawking scale omega equal one over r. So even in this uh, situation, which is quite under control and, uh, and simple, you find perhaps the emergence again of this, uh, uh, of this uh, softening of the final state radiation. Of course, at the expense of having a lot of particle production. So uh, real, this brings me to, the, fin yeah, to yeah, the final- Yeah, to the final- 16 minutes, yeah. Yeah, I have only one more slide besides this one. So, so far we have discussed this weak gravity regime at large impact parameters, a string gravity regime in which the string length makes your life easy. But of course the big challenge is how to go from region one and two, cross this red line, which is where you expect to find a critical line be behind, be um, sorry, um, um, behind which you expect collapse. And so my last slide will be about this uh, so-called strong gravity regime in which you go to uh, energies and impact parameters such that you expect black hole production. Now, an interesting question is whether you should approach this regime starting from, uh, you know, from this uh, string length being bigger than B or the opposite. We uh, looked at the second case and uh, we made some progress, but short of solving, of course, the, the question. Uh, in this case, you can check that the semi classical contribution to the scattering amplitude come from some effective three amplitudes, which you can resum in a two-dimensional or D minus two-dimensional in general effective field theory, which is some kind of crude approximation to, um, to something worked out by Lipatov. So this really, is- If you allow me, maybe uh, we could put this slide on after uh, David finishes and- uh, Yeah, yeah this, is, yeah, this has a, a list of questions. And of course, yeah, th this is my last slide and uh, uh, I just listed a few questions, which I think would be 
the matter of discussion for the for the following discussion. So I'm perfectly fine with stopping here. Very good, very good. So thank you, thank you, and let's switch to David, and then we'll thank uh, both uh, both of you. So David, you can share your screen, and you will probably have around. Oh, I have to unshare. I have to. Stop. You can unshare, or if David starts sharing, I think he will over. It will be automatic. It will be automatic. So David uh, officially would have like one minute and ten seconds, but I think we'll we'll give uh, we'll no, no, no. <laughs> we will extend a little bit. It's the informal part of the meeting anyway. Okay, David, please take it away. Well, luckily uh, there is nothing after us, so uh, uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together this innovative addition to the strings. Uh, and, and for managing to carry this off in the middle of a pandemic, which is hitting Brazil very hard, uh, congratulations. So far, it's great. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly and try to fit into my 10 minutes uh, a discussion, a very small aspect of high energy string scattering. Um, and I'll be discussing, if you want, the fixed angle high energy string scattering or the string length going to infinity, string tension going to zero, alpha prime going to infinity limit of string theory. I'll remind you of some old work, uh, which hasn't been followed up much in recent years, but and I think should be in the saddle point analysis of string world sheets, which is relevant in this limit uh, in perturbation, string perturbation theory. And then some uh, recent work uh, reviving, trying to explore an old idea of Polchinski, Horowitz, Suskin, Amadi, Russo, and others uh, on trying to um, identify massive string states with black holes and, and, and probe uh, stringy black hole microstates. So let me uh, just remind you that, well, this is the um, bosonic or sorry or closed string amplitude roughly uh, uh, in tree approximation uh, which of course is a integral a sum over uh, the exponential of the area of the world sheet in string length units and um, you see from this that uh, at you know, this is determined by a saddle point in X, which is exact since it's a Gaussian integral, and X actually is increasing like the string length squared. So it's getting, string is expanding in this scattering as the string length or the energy goes to infinity, and the area as well. And um, the integral is not just over the string, but over the um, positions, the moduli of the world sheet, the positions of the, of the uh, vertex operators, uh, zi, uh, which can be determined by the so-called scattering equations, which are essentially the uh, equations that determine the positions of electrostatic null charges that are placed on the, on the uh, Riemann sphere. Uh, for the case of the four-point amplitude, there, there's a unique saddle point, and the answer, of course, agrees with the Venetiano formula, which uh, A is given by, and behaves like e to the minus s, or L string squared times s, times some function of the scattering angle, which is not important. So this extremely soft behavior was noticed immediately uh, when the beta function was introduced and is very, very soft, much softer than the power law uh, that one encounters in quantum field theory at uh, large momentum, uh, and even softer than the uh, bound proven in quantum theory, proven using unitarity causality and assumptions of polynomial boundedness by Sorellis and Martin. Uh, that's an indication that something, uh, that clearly the tree approximation is not sufficient 
uh, unitarity obviously is not satisfied and that one needs to go to higher orders to uh, understand whether this soft behavior, this violation is actually there in string theory. Uh, I'd like to show you what the string scattering actually looks like. The saddle point gives you a, a picture in uh, complex trajectory space of uh, strings scattering. So uh, we're going to picture that world sheet in temporal gauge um, where the strings start out as point-like objects coming in from infinity, uh, expand, merge, split, and scatter. And the area of the surface is increasing like L string to the fourth. And the amplitude, therefore, as before, goes like e to the minus L squared times the energy squared. Uh, what's nice about this picture is that it is universal. It doesn't depend actually on the nature of the incoming string particles as long as they are light as L string goes to infinity. Um, and uh, it actually, as we'll see, is essentially the same up to scale uh, for what might be the dominant saddle points to all orders in perturbation theory. And that strongly suggests that in this limit of the tensionless string, there is some uh, very uh, large symmetry uh, group of some kind um, which governs the tension of the string. Uh, although admittedly, all attempts to understand, to expand on that uh, suggestion have so far failed. I think it, it, it's worthy of, in, of, of uh, much further investigation. If one tries to generalize this to higher orders, it turns out to be quite simple. Uh, in lowest order, essentially one, one is finding the equilibrium position of null charges pi on, on the complex plane uh, in electrostatics. And in order to go to genus 2, the torus, one can simply take two copies of the complex plane of the Riemann sphere and with half the charge at each uh, and, and, and connect these charges by uh, square root branch points and construct the genus 2 surface, which is obviously in equilibrium um, as before. And one is describing the torus as this um, um, curve uh, with square root branch points at the vertex, at the vertices where the charges are located. This has a generalization to uh, hyperelliptic surfaces in uh, genus N. Um, and in such a case, one can simply generalize the same picture of high energy scattering as before, except that the um, strings, which are in this case closed strings, each of those lines really is a uh, a string that winds around twice. And in higher orders, what happens is simply the charges are reduced by a factor of 1 over g plus 1, and therefore the string shrinks and loops upon itself twice. In genus 2, loops upon itself three times. In general, uh, the size of the string decreases so it goes like L string squared times the momentum, but is reduced by a factor of g plus 1. However, the area, uh, therefore, uh, decreases by a factor of 1 over g plus 1 squared, but they're g plus 1 sheets to construct this Riemann surface. So the total area of this world sheet decreases like 1 over the genus plus 1. And the amplitude, um, if Lowest order goes like this, to order g, the g loop uh, at this kind of saddle point uh, is much 
bigger it, since the exponent has this factor of one over g plus one. So what is interesting is that the uh, what perhaps is the dominant saddle point, although th there are many, many saddle points and this certainly hasn't been proved, but there are good physical arguments where this might be the dominant saddle point for fixed angle and to, uh, to arbitrary order in perturbation theory uh, gets bigger and bigger as one goes higher and higher in perturbation theory. So this is an indication that perturbation theory certainly does not converge and an indication that the dominant saddle in higher order perturbation theory corresponds to a smaller and smaller string size. Uh, one can try to sum perturbation theory as uh, was suggested in our original paper and then Mendy and Oguri worked this out in some great detail using our, our understanding of the genus G saddle points and argued that uh, in fact, the dominant saddle in the in a saddle point analysis of the Borel resummed sum uh, has a comes from genus uh, and comes from genus n or uh, which is actually of order square root of uh, s, uh, or, and therefore that the amplitude itself goes like, uh, is reduced by the same one over n and satisfies the Cirillus-Martin bound. So this is a very interesting indication that um, one might be able to push this kind of semi-classical analysis and resummation and recover something which uh, is consistent, I think, probably the, the only kind of behavior that is consistent with polynomial bounds in this uh, of string amplitudes. It also suggests that the size of the string, which is scattering in, at, at, in this limit, is of order L string, and it's reduced by the same factor of one over n. You uh, use uh, ten minutes, David. Just to... yeah, um, I'll, I'll, I'll finish in a moment. And so, uh, however, there are indeed many, many saddle points. There are issues of contours of integration. Much, much work would need to be done to make this solid and to understand the non-perturbative behavior of um, strings in this limit. Uh, what I want to suggest in the last minute with that, that I don't have uh, is, is that one should really try to use perturbative string theory and so or semi-classical string theory to discuss uh, massive strings as black holes, as was suggested by Polchinski, Horvitz, and Susskind and others. Uh, in string theory, of course, Newton's constant is proportional to the string uh, coupling squared. And for a massive string um, whose mass goes like the square root of the level number in string units, the Schwarzschild radius, if we try, if we imagine that, the, that a massive string uh, um, as we increase, um, as we decrease G string, will shrink uh, to be of order L string. That will occur when G string squared is of order one over square root of n. So that Polchinski and Horvitz suggested that one might be able to discuss strings within their Schwarzschild radius for large n. Uh, and small g string. This is actually quite weak coupling. For example, the correction to the mass of this massive state should be of order g squared m, which is of order one compared to its mass, which is growing like square root of n for at level n. They also showed that the black hole entropy, the Bekenstein Hawking entropy of such of a black hole, um, g m squared, um, and in, in, at this point is of order g squared n, which is of order square root of n, and that is the same behavior as the string entropy, uh, the log of the density of uh, states of a string at level n, which goes like square root of n. So the suggestion was that a weakly coupled massive string might be uh, 
a representation of black hole microstates, and one can use the explicit uh, ability in string theory to analyze in weak coupling um, all the incredibly, the exponential number of states to describe black hole microstates. And this was, uh, I thought, I think, um, strengthened by Amati and Russo, who studied the decay of a massive string into photons and other massive strings, averaging over all the initial states of the same mass and summing over all outgoing heavy string states, and found that the decay rate as a function of the photon energy obeys a black body spectrum where the temperature that's given by the Hagedorn Hacker, temperature of the string at this uh, level, at this, um, with this coupling, uh, which equals the black hole temperature at the correspondence point. So that suggests uh, studying massive string scattering amplitudes, which is something I've been doing with uh, Vladimir Rosenhaus recently. In particular, I just want to show you a, one of the simplest results of a massive string decaying to two light strings. There are many massive string states, of course, labeled by the various uh, oscillators one can excite using uh, DDF formalism to describe physical, uh, black, uh, physical string states. Uh, the typical states are given by a Boltzmann distribution and with a level number which is increasing rapidly as n goes to infinity, like square root of n. And what we find is that the amplitude has a uh, very interesting dependence on the angle between of the scattering um, particles and their polarization, and has extremely chaotic behavior, which varies very sensitively as one varies this angle, or varies the polarization, or changes uh, by a very small amount the nature of the black hole microstate. Uh, it's extremely chaotic. This function, as you see, has zeros for all rational uh, values of the square of the cosine of half the angle. Um, nothing could be more chaotic and uh, might be an indication of the, of the chaotic dynamics of these microstates, uh, which might be identified as black hole microstates. So I'm... Uh, Maybe, uh, I, I suggest we stop, David, and then... I'm, uh, over, and I'm just going to say that the scattering equations, which actually determine the saddle points that determine these behaviors for, for massive states, uh, have a beautiful generalization uh, uh, to the case where you have massive states. P hard here is the momentum of a massive state of mass uh, square root of 2n, and psi is the polarization, and this is a generalization of the famous scattering equations, which appear many places. And although um, this is a very simple example. So uh, there, my original goal way back was to find a high spin symmetry that controls the high energy tensionless perturbative string that still hasn't been done at all. Uh, one would hope, I was always hoping that ADS-CFT could be used to determine the non-perturbative high energy string scattering in flat space. I think that might come up in the discussion. Uh, hasn't been done. And I'm quite excited by the ability, perhaps, to uh, take the one theory of, of uh, which has a, an enormous number of explicitly treatable perturbatively uh, states which might correspond to black holes and discuss in detail their properties, the chaos, their decays, their, and so on and so on. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. So before we move to the, the questions, uh, let me just suggest uh, something. So uh, as I suggested in the previous discussion, if you, you are very much encouraged to turn on our camera so that it, it feels like a more informal discussion and raise your hand when you want to ask a question. But not only do that, but please, if uh, uh, what you want to ask or follow up or comment, if it is related to what we are now discussing right now, signal, wave or write in the chat or something, 
so that we can know that uh, we are keeping on the same topic before we decide, okay, I'll move to and we'll move to a new topic, right? So if you have follow-ups on a particular topic that is really being discussed right now, it's much better to keep, to stay on that topic. So make sure to wave or to write in the chat and we'll stay with the same topic until we move to the next one. Okay, let's try to see. Yeah, we are all learning. I mean, hopefully in a few sessions we'll be super professional, but for now, let's, uh, let's learn as we go. So thank you very much, David and um, Gabriele. And maybe we could start with uh, the question by Juan. Yeah, so just a comment that uh, the, oh. the high energy behavior of string scattering, at least in perturbation theory, which has the leading order three level, it's uh, related to chaos in the near horizon geometry of a black hole, as shown by Schenker and Stanford and also Kitaev. And that's somehow an interesting connection between sort of like something that looks like high energy in the bulk, but from the bound, from the point of view of the microstates of the black hole have to do with the chaos and let's say low energy dynamics of the black hole, black hole states. It's just a comment. And so it, it relates uh, sort of regi behavior to let's say Lyapuno behavior of, uh, uh, of chaos. So. So this was very much related to what, what was also discussed in, in, in the morning, right? And where there are recent papers trying to prove that behavior and that bound on chaos from an asymmetric yes, point yes. of view, right? One of the problems is in, in string theory, how to define the Lyapunov exponent. Uh, how do you define the Lyapunov exponent just from the S matrix? Well, the way it was defined in the black hole case was through uh, these out of time order correlators. Perhaps, uh, I guess in the S matrix, Polchinski had a paper where he was uh, suggesting changing some of the initial particles and then uh, looking at how the particles change uh, late, sometime later. Uh, so right. it included so, a bit of a transform. Otak, to real time. So OTACs aren't available in string theory, as far as I know. but. Uh, one could discuss time delay. Um, in a well, I think, if, I mean, another analogy is that the OTOC is essentially the imaginary part of the scattering episode. I mean, they, they, they probe some of the same physics, but uh, you can ask, is, the growth in time is a bit different here. I guess if you put it in string theory, it's, uh, like the energy that one was mentioning is that large boosts mapped to large time are very far outside of the black hole. And I guess uh, in this analogy where they measure part of the amplitude is no talk, we're still talking about high energy limit or large boosts and not very really large time behavior. Maybe I can ask a, a quick question about that. that I think it's about that, but uh, I'm not a specialist. But in the Leonardo's talk, he was mentioning that two subtractions was enough and that in some situations, we knew that the behavior was S to some power that depended on the dimension at large energy. Right, Leonardo? It was based on uh, private communication from Sasha. He's Sasha in the chat. Okay, but my question was that a big power looks to be then much smaller than what string theory would give, right? String theory would give two minus something that could be very small, but that was two minus something finite. So no. I was confused. What? How? How was? How is that uh, resolved? Or is? The, or what is my confusion? Well, the, the the formulas that you are saying in string, it's a three-level amplitude, right? And the formulas that Leonardo showed, it's quantum bound. Right. That's right. So the, quantum, the, the standard quantum, register of the graviton is just a three-level string theory, and and the bounds I was showing us are, are meant to be non-perturbed. I see. Okay, because they are much stronger, right? It's very, it's much smaller than S square, right? It's S to some finite power, really, right? Well, it, it's not much stronger. It's not much smaller. It's between, uh, so in D equals seven, say for the most conservative, you get two, and in D equal infinity, you get three halves. And then it's monotonic. Maybe, maybe a comment I will add on this, maybe briefly before we move on, is that, uh, I mean, one gets even stronger results if you look at fixed impact parameter where the exponent goes down to one. And for the sort of things I was looking at this morning, we have 
we integrate the amplitude against the wave packet that has compact support in momentum and fast decay uh, in large impact parameter, the bound is actually one for us. Well, actually, the, exponent, the rigid it, exponent is much closer to one than to two. It, at fixed input parameter, eventually the, the amplitude should be exponentially small. Well, what we're, what we're looking at is one minus the, the amplitude. Oh, part. one minus the amplitude, the S matrix or the, no, the T matrix. T matrix. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, other questions or comments or follow-ups on this topic? Otherwise maybe uh, Hiroshi? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so unless there are uh, some follow up uh, question discussion, I'd like to pose different question, uh, which is that uh, does a consistency with holography in high energy limit require extended object in quantum gravity? Since this is a string theory conference, so I want to ask whether string theory is, is mandatory uh, for consistency. And so I'd like to offer two examples which may be relevant. So one is a Landau singularity in ADHFC correspondence, which is studied by Juan Marotzena, David Simon Zafin, and Sasha Zivoidov. And so that the Landau singularity happens when the external points are connected to bulk point uh, by null geodesics. And if that does not correspond to uh, a boundary on di diagrams, then uh, this singularity has to be resolved. And uh, in this case, these are resolved by gross Mende effect at finite angle scattering that David talked about. However, uh, in, I should say that in this setup, uh, even without the gross Mende effect, even without the extended object, the formation and the evaporation of black hole can still resolve the singularity. So in this case, it's just that uh, the gross Mende effect, when the gross Mende effect exists, they dominate over the black hole effect. So, so, so in this case, string, uh, extended object does not seem to be mandatory, but I would like to offer another example this is the Adamar singularity in the two-point function in the ADS black hole. So, so this was a case that uh, 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 Matthew Dodderson and I studied recently. And in this case, uh, the singularity is caused by narrow geodesics circling outside of photon sphere of the black hole. And uh, we do not expect uh, that uh, the such singularity in the dual CFT description. So it has to be <coughs> And Matthew and I showed that it is resolved by tidal force on string wall sheet. So the tidal force stretches and contracts the strings and cause particle production on the wall sheet and this smoothens out the singularity. <laughs> so, so in this case, uh, since there is no focusing of energy, uh, unlike the Landau singularity in the first example I gave, so I do not see how strong gravitational effects such as formation of black hole and evaporation can help. And so perhaps uh, uh, maybe there are somebody who can comment on this, but uh, it seems to me that uh, in this particular setup, uh, having extended objects like strings or membrane seems to be the only way to resolve this Adamar singularity. So, so this seems to suggest uh, a way to demonstrate that extended objects are important. Very good. Maybe another example that is related is the work by uh, Simon, Zohar, and uh, Amit, and uh, I will forget, uh, Sasha, right? On the large S and T, uh, where uh, they also explain some universal string behavior, right? Or they, they argue using bootstrap for universal string like behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, this is a great topic. So I don't know if people want to uh, chime in on whether we need string theory for sure. Well, but of course, they make an assumption uh, of having weakly coupled, infinitely massive strings. You know, they assume a lot of things which we only know show up in string theory. Yeah, we assume some things that we don't we not like to assume. Uh, maybe I could add from Google's bootstrap perspective, there's something special about theories with gravity, which is what we're looking at here, which is that you're forced to have higher spin states in the UV to have, uh, you cannot, uh, like, because you have some rules which express the lower energy gravity in terms of heavy states, so you need heavy states. And, and then we can ask a question, like, how much can you read 
get rid of the, you know, from, from, from perspective of the spectrum, like the fact that you have extended object is some pattern about states with large spin, because the spin is related to the size of the object. So, so, so in some sense, in gravity, you're forced to have higher spin objects. Now, you know, you've, but, but interpreting these objects as, interpreting these higher spin states in terms of extended objects is not being done. Sorry, could those highest spin objects come from loops? Loops of low spin particles? I mean, are you forced to have genuine high spin? Yeah, that's that's the thing which is boring. So so in, in principle, they could be just like multi-particle states, and then then you're not really predicting any physics, but then you don't really solve crossing symmetry. So so there was a, for example, Pedro and all at this uh, this work where they try to get rid of the states as much as they can and and, and push the cut off the Planck scale. But that, that's not going the direction of weakly coupled string, but they, they still they still discover new states at the Planck scale. And there's some rigid trajectories that, that have some funny, uh, some is described some strongly coupled strings, but they have some trajectories which which are not linear, but which which go from this Planck scale, Planck scale states. Yeah, so, so it's a challenge to show that the states, you, you really need states that, that look like uh, weakly coupled. Uh, but if, if, you, if you assume that new states come at the like scale, you, you like to show that somehow they're organized to something like string theory, but that's not, uh, not clear. But as Leonardo was showing also this morning, some of the bounds we have, they're not saturated in string theory, but like string theory is not so far. So, so it feels like we're actually starting to corner it. Mm -hmm. Uh, Samir? Yeah, hi. I had a question uh, or maybe a comment uh, on what uh, David was saying at the end of his uh, nice presentation about the horowitz polchinski uh, correspondence point where a string sort of seems to just about go into a black hole and the entropy sort of matches at the point where a string is getting into its uh, Schwarzschild lim uh, horizon limit. Uh, way back around that time, we had looked at this and we found that actually that is not a smooth crossover. And what happens is exactly at the point where a string is trying to go into its black hole radius, <clears throat> a different set of degrees of freedom becomes light, which are given by fractal NS5 brains. So one might think that NS5 brains are heavy because they go like one by G squared and G is still uh, taken small. But what we had learned from black hole entropy just you know earlier the same year, or 96, is that these brains come in fractal units. So if you have, you know, some charges like, uh, you know, string winding and momentum charges, then the other brains will come in fractal units of those charges. And when you put all that in there, you find that just about the point when this guy wants to go, a string wants to go inside its horizon, the fractal five brains actually become lighter. And if you don't think of them as the correct degrees of freedom giving the entropy, then in fact, there is a contradiction with the low energy absorption properties of this string mess. So the entropy seems to match, but it's counting the wrong degrees of freedom because just after the string shrinks, in, shrinks into its horizon, the string's vibration degrees of freedom actually freeze. And if you don't freeze them, you get the wrong absorption properties. Those degrees freeze, the other ones which are fractal five frames, they become light, and then the absorption properties are restored. So I know that doesn't make much sense uh, sort of looking out of context, but maybe offline we could discuss that with anybody who's interested. Well, may, may, maybe I can add a, a comment to your comment. Uh, sure. uh, you know, in the in a work we I did with um, <clears throat> with uh, Thibaut Damour, we tried to understand this uh, correspondence point in a slightly different way, namely as a self gravitating effect of the, of the string. So, because the point is, if you have a string which has a mass which is parametrically larger than the string scale, then its typical size will be bigger than L string, right? A typical size will, you know, goes like a random walk and, yeah, and, but that... and goes with the mass. However, what we found with, with Damour is that self-gravitating effect can actually account for a density of states which 
at the corresponding point is large enough to, to reproduce the entropy. On the other hand, trying to go beyond that, namely to higher mass, sounds very difficult. I mean, something very magic has to happen in order for the string entropy to keep matching the black hole entropy above that corresponding point. I was hoping in that, but I, I got very frustrated. And my tentative conclusion, maybe it goes well with what Samir is saying, is that somehow you is no longer a single heavy string which matches the, the entropy. You need many more degrees of freedom. It's a little bit related to what I was calling fractionation, namely, you know, uh, light strings being produced or maybe light other objects being produced on top of the, of the, of the, of the heavy string. I don't, I don't believe now that a single heavy string state will, will be able to reproduce the entropy beyond the correspondence point. Well, the, yeah, the correspondence point is sort of a crossover between where it's a good description to perhaps use perturbative strings or semi-classical string yeah, theory. That I, I can yeah. agree, yeah. yeah. But, you know, yeah. it's not obvious. I think there is also some work by, by some recent work by Juan about this large delimit, which may have some bearing of this issue. I don't know if Juan is still around. Yeah, uh, right. Because he's trying to approach this point from above. Yeah. You know, from the, from the black hole side. Right, right. My point was that if one has one small region where G string is adjusted and, and the mass, the energy is big enough, to where one can dis explore in detail, microstate by microstate, uh, the behavior of black hole microstates, that's extremely useful. Mm -hmm. uh, even if one can't you know, go to higher energies or stronger coupling. By the way, David, I, I have one more example, which is similar to Amati Russo. Uh, when you look at these uh, tidal excitations of the string that we, we have in this high energy thing, if you just look at the mass distribution of the, of the tidally excited state, that is, you know, uh, Boltzmann-like, uh, temperature-like, you know, like Hagedorn, you know, e to the minus m over t, something like this. On the other hand, if you look into the details, you find the perfectly unitary asymmetric. So the, the microstates are there to ensure that uh, you know, information is preserved. But if you look at it just roughly in terms of distribution, then it looks thermal, not, not really thermal, but you know, some Boltzmann-like. So that's similar to to a materials. By the way, speaking of uh, tidal effects, uh, Emil had a comment on uh, the chat that would be nicely related to Hiroshi's point. So maybe. Uh, oh, I see. I don't know if. Uh, Let's see. Emil, Emil would yeah. like to unmute. Yeah, I was just uh, saying. I mean, the 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 tidal effects uh, for a probe that has some impact parameter into the photon sphere seems to be just some bulk gravitational physics uh, as opposed to anything that has to do with uh, what's making up the microstates of the black hole. I would be curious if there's a comment. A, a related question I wanted to ask uh, David Gross is what's the small parameter that controls um, any calculation in this correspondence principle regime? Because the energies of order one over G string squared so is there some resummation you can do that controls um, the properties of this state that's sort of on the verge of becoming yeah. a black hole using so, string theory? The lowest order, uh, 
it's n the the level number or the energy of the state okay because g string goes like one over n to, to the one quarter um, so the the uh perturbation theory is is a nice asymptotic expansion there however i have no doubt that higher orders in perturbation theory will exhibit the same issues that came up in fixed angle scattering and they will be more dominant uh, and in fact what i'm hoping well what might be the case is that there's a kind of again universality of the kinds of saddle points that dominate uh, the behavior of these microstates and their scatterings uh, and that one can learn qu at least qualitative if not quantitative things about the scattering to all orders and then maybe resum and that's the region where the string actually uh, isn't growing as one pumps in energy but but remains of order the string length in the scattering uh, which is really needed for this correspondence principle to work. Horvitz and, and, and uh, Polchinski and others try, you know, made arguments about gravitational effects, which would keep yeah. string uh, small as they scatter at high energies. But, uh, and that's, that seems to be what happens in fixed angle, light string scattering, the, the string shrinks. Uh, and in high orders, uh, it's, it shrinks to the size of the string scale. Maybe we can um, go to Harvard. Uh, yeah, so I, I actually have a related uh, question slash comment um, about the hard scattering limit of strings. Uh, so I, I guess I'm wondering, to what extent one can reasonably expect perturbation string perturbation theory to capture the high energy you know, hard scattering limit? Now, uh, first, uh, as a technical point, uh, in David's uh, talk, he mentioned the Borel uh, resummation. Uh, uh, the work was done by uh, Mendel and Uguri, as far as I recall, uh, was for a bosonic string. I'm not sure if they, I'm not aware of a super string update, but let's say, presumably, it's. Uh, I think it was it was also, I mean, the our analysis extended to the heterotic string as well. I'm sure, and and uh, I don't think that really matters much. Uh, okay, because I mean, the, the, the thing is, the, the thing that the matter was not the the, the position of the cell point in the modular space, but rather the sort of the one correction on top of that of a prime, and uh, uh, that um, uh, for. So, so I'm not sure if the analysis has been done for super string, but anyway, I'm not uh, questioning the qualitative uh, feature of, of the result. Uh, but, uh, but still, I mean, this priori summation, a priori one could miss a number of perturbative corrections. Uh, at, so there's an energy scale at which um, uh, the uh, dominant genus, let's say, will be comparable to the uh, order at which the perturbation theory is supposed to, or number of effects is supposed to be important. Um, and so uh, what can one really expect reasonable? I think this is an extremely complicated problem. I mean, one needs to, uh, even in the case of fixed angle scattering of light particles that was analyzed by Hiroshi and uh, Paul back then, uh, they, you know, they're, they're, nobody even knows, has classified or counted the number of saddle points of those integrals, and certainly not discussed the contours of integration, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an enormous amount of work that would need to be done to make it solid. But it's... Uh, uh, yeah, but, but uh, the, 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 the thing is, so, so all of this discussion was, of course, still within the realm of perturbation theory. Uh, we know uh, in, we certainly know examples where uh, there are number of contributions to string scattering amplitude, say graviton scattering amplitude in type 2B string theory, that's not in fact captured by any perturbative, uh, like, you know, R to the fourth, there's some nice corrections and so, so forth. And uh, potentially they could be important or, or not for this, uh, in, in, 
you know, in, in order to extrapolate to, to the high energy regime for, for the hard scattering. On the other hand, on the other hand, uh, as I tried to say in my talk, uh, if you use this iconal resummation and you go to the specific regime in which there is no classical saddle point, there's only a complex saddle point, we do reproduce precisely the gross mende auguri behavior e to the minus square root of s. And this is a completely different approach and it, it confirms fully the result. However, only in a limited energy range. And in fact, the Borelli summation of Mende Oguri only works in a limited energy range. So you cannot go to infinite energy. So it really so depends. May, maybe that, that is where you, you become non perturbative. If you try to extrapolate to infinite energy, indeed, the, the whole thing breaks down. And then it depends if you are at uh, if 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 you are at um, if if you are at high energy and fixed angle, then the the iconal will take over. You know, uh, gravitationally you can deflect by ninety degree. There is no problem. You have gravitational deflection of ninety degree easily. You don't have to. You know to. So uh, the, the difficult thing in gravity is to go to short distances where you have black hole formation. To have large angle scattering, you know, look at the inspiraling black holes. They have a lot of uh, deflection angle, the inspiral, and still is a, is a soft physics problem, is a large distance problem. And that's what, uh, what we have been claiming all the time. If you go to infinitely high energy, and fixed angle, it is large distance. If you want to go to short distances, you better go to small impact parameter, period. However, I do, I, I am convinced by a variety of reasons, which I didn't have time to explain, that this e to the minus square root of s, which in Thorellis Martin claimed was a, uh, a, upper, a lower bound, is probably correct in any causal theory. Um, and that I- is probably <laughs> correct. But in the theory of gravity is, is certainly correct because the amplitude uh, is big at fixed angle, is big. So you certainly satisfy the cellulose Martin bound. It's order one, <laughs> it's not even exponentially small. You have elastic scattering in gravity. With big deflection angles. It's enough to go to large impact parameters and you pick up a contribution. Yeah, I know we, <laughs> we had a long discussion about this many, many years ago. <laughs> I mean, yeah. uh, I think it would be nice to have some uh, input also from someone that would give us some feedback from ADS. Is there uh, some? That would be excellent. So, what could we learn from ADS? We have all these speculations. How could it be? How could it be? In principle, in ADS, everything should be <laughs> very well defined. So, yeah, maybe Juan well, or Juan could say, I would love to hear a little bit about what could ADS teach us about these questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I would ask the question to Leonardo because I'm, I was a bit puzzled because in principle, we could say, let's use ADS to define, the, let's say, let's use the flat space limit of ADS CFT to define the scattering amplitude non-perturbatively. And then we study the high energy limit using what we know about the rigid limit of CFT correlators. But this is very subtle because you have two limits and in principle, they don't commute. You have to take the flat space limit first and then the high energy limit. But I got a bit confused because this morning, I think Leonardo was saying that they established that double subtracted dispersion relations just goes through from ADS to flat space. So maybe maybe he can help the me. The correct out. statement in Simon Ken Chupin is that the, um, 
some sense tautologically, if you have a CFT correlator that has a good flat space limit, so the, the, the S matrix that come as a limit of ADS will obey a double subtractive relation. I think that's clear. Because what we show in the recent paper is that you can just uplift the flat space, um, the, flat, the, the flat space bounds that come from double subtraction to, to good CFT uh, dispersion relations, and there's no doubt that those are valid in, as a CFT. So if you grant me this limit, then it will work. But Why? I think, well, I think there's more about... stronger opinions about this, so he perhaps can... Uh, no, I have a simple comment about the order of limit issue, is that, I mean, there's no free launch in CFT. The, the reason we, the reason our bounds of lift is that we dodge the bullet. And, and the, the bullet that I, could, I think you described, Zhao, is that uh, there are issues about estimating the Fourier transform from impact parameter to momentum space. And, and there are issues about bounding things in impact parameters because in principle, you need infinite momentum to define impact parameters and pursuits explicitly. And we dodge both these bullets by basically looking at functionals that have compact support in momentum and that have decay in, moment, decay in impact, parallel decay at large impact. And that, that's why our bounds work. I mean, it's not like a CFT miracle. It's just because we, we, we have a flat space mechanism to avoid these issues. What so, we, so more precisely, we prove dispersion relations for amplitudes integrated against these sort of test functions. That's what we really prove. Uh, Joao, why do you have to take the flat limit first? What, isn't it enough to have a, an ADS radius which is large compared to impact parameter and short shield? I mean, I, I was just imagining, so you have a function, well, let's just say two parameters, this, let's say S, like the energy in units of ADS, yeah. and N, the large N limit of the gauge theory. Yeah. And you could have some behavior like growing very fast as a function of S up to some power of n, so let's say up to order n, but then mm -hmm. the actual CFT bound is that when s is the largest parameter, we know it cannot grow faster than say s, if you want a quantum regibound. So, but then if we want a flat space limit, we have to first take n to infinity, so we could be actually having, mm -hmm. we could have a bigger growth below n than what we can prove in the CFT. So that's why I, I would worry in principle. So I, I would like to understand why this does not happen. How can we show this does not happen? This is what. Let me maybe make one comment that one regime, which is not yet, which did not yet make, made con was made contact between flat space and ADS is precisely this gross Mander regime. So if we could construct minimal surfaces in ADS for high energy scattering, that then in a limit where the radius becomes bigger, they would reduce to the minimal surfaces that uh, uh, David and Mende found, that will be, I think, useful as well. To, it's not a corner of the flat space limit, which was not yet uh, realized. It's not e easy to input this behavior in the S metrics booster, right? It's impossible, yeah. Right now, yeah, high energy, it's, a, it's terrible. Yeah. Either we don't know how to, well, so often we know how to do it, but uh, typically it doesn't impact the low energy quantities. So high energy and low energy are really disconnected in this matrix bootstrap for now. Why do you have to take n to infinity? Can't you discuss this for a finite n, finite g string? The flat space limit for large. That's n. what we think we do. Then, then you're not in flat space. Yeah. Okay, but if the process happens in a region which is small compared to the ADS radius, you should learn something. Yeah, that, that's the picture we have. So it's like you know, we're like the like the idea that you know we live in a curved space, but we can still build the LHC and use flat space carrying amplitude to describe yeah, what happens it's, there. So think that's of the ADS we're using. As, as an infrared we're not, Yeah, we're not really taking our ideas to infinity. We're just like making sure right. we're looking at some rules where corrections are one over our RDS square or small, numerically small. Also, you don't have to send the energy to infinity. As I said, it's it's enough to to have a short radius, which is bigger than the impact parameter. I suggest uh, 
we thank uh, David and Gabriele. And those who want to continue informally chatting, we continue a bit more, but uh, we are only 200 right now. So I think. <laughs> if, uh, and I'm already on Slack <laughs> if anybody wants yeah. to. <laughs> and yes, if there are more questions, please, uh, as Gabriele said, uh, we have Slack and uh, please do use it both for this session and for the ones that follow. Yeah. Okay.